Let's have a chat now with Elizabeth Jones. I've got to watch myself here. She's from UKIP. Last radio interview she did, though, she lost the rag and started shouting at her guest. We won't have that kind of behaviour, because that's my job. <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm delighted to say Elizabeth joins us now to have a look through the top stories of the day. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello there, John. I hope you're going to be on your best behaviour, otherwise I shall have to get out my whip. Oof. Well, you can get whipped back if you do. Oh, very nice. Uh, right, let's talk first of all. Let's start off with Scotland. The voters swung back the other way. 51% now in favour of staying in the Union. What do you make of what's gone on this week? Was there an overreaction from the established, established political classes when the three stooges ran up to Scotland? What do you think? Well, I think, frankly, that the Scottish independence campaign is as camp as knickers. I mean, I, it's just absolute theatre. Uh, it, it's, it's unbelievable. I guarantee that the Scotland will uh, vote to stay in the union. You've got a, a whole host of crazy characters up there. You've got Alex Salmon, the classic pie fat. Uh, beer swillings, uh, classical, trying to be a working class Scot, I think probably isn't working class. Um, you've got the clash with the Irish. You've got Tom Elliott, leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, describing the SNP as a greater threat to the union than the violence of the IRA. I think that's a bit over the top, but anyway. Well, exactly, on, that's what I'm saying. It's absolutely, it's full on opera, it's full on theatre, this campaign. But you actually believe it's going to turn out that they will stay in the union. Why are you so convinced of that? I mean, uh, we listened to another UKIP person yesterday saying exactly the same thing, uh, the, uh, David Coburn, the only uh, UKIP MEP in Scotland. Why are you so convinced, Elizabeth? Well, it just makes economic sense. I mean, if you look at the stats, uh, since Scotland's had devolution, they've significantly outspent uh, their revenues, their public debt is titanic, and who's the only person in town who can underpin that and pay it all off for the them English. and assist them? The English. Exactly. Do you find it ironic they don't want to be part of our union because they say it's not very democratic, but they want to be part of a bigger union, the European Union? What do you make of that? Well, what can I say? They probably think that this is uh, um, a better a better way forward for their future. I have no idea why. Uh, I think the EU will invite them in with open arms. The EU always wants to add to its empire. They won't have the op option to uh, not have the euro. They will be uh, in the uh, euro. And uh, I don't understand what the glamour is. I, t I think, again, it, to me, this is just one long camp opera performance. And it's... Um, Scotland, well, basically I'm in Alex Salmon and his personality issues flicking two Vs um, at the United Kingdom. But I frankly see the Thursday vote. I'd like to quote Mark Olmond on this. On. His fabulous qu uh, lyric from Say Hello, Wave Goodbye. I've put up with all the scenes, but this is one scene that's <laughs> going to be played my way. And I think that's what the Scots will be saying to Alex Salmon. No well, more campery. We've had enough of the drama. The only problem is, Elizabeth, now, though, with the concessions that Gordon Brown took up on behalf of all three parties, they're actually going to get Devo Max Plus, aren't they? If he loses on Thursday, he actually gets more power in a way, and he also keeps all the money from England. Uh, yes, but I think the vote is just a straightforward yes, no. They're not going to actually be voting for no, Devo not, Max. But, they, but that's the concession now to persuade people to vote no, isn't it? That's why Brown gave that a concession. So what I'm trying to get to is that if they do vote no, they actually still win anyway, in a sense. Well, that's the canny Scott for you coming out, isn't it? Many a muckle makes a pound. So, of course, they're going to be uh, trying to look for the best financial okay. advantage, and you really can't blame them. But I, as I understand with Devo Max, what's going to happen with that? They won't get a, the block grant from the UK. What they'll uh, do instead is be able to keep all the Scottish revenue income. All that shortbread. No, oh, I know. <laughs> Tell, <laughs> talk to me about Nigel Farage. He's gone to Scotland to campaign in favour of the union. Uh, he's not going to go down very well, is he? He doesn't get a very good warm welcome in the Highlands or even the Lowlands or even the Central Belt. They hate his guts, don't they, in Scotland? Well, I don't think they all hate his guts. They can't possibly all hate the, his guts because they voted in one UKIP MEP. We've got David Coburn, so someone somewhere voted UKIP like at a lumpet. And again, it's all part of the Scottish opera. It's all part of the camp show. Let's go out and scream and shout at Nigel Farage. You think the way they attacked him uh, the last time or the time before last when he went up was out of order? And do you think there have been quite a lot of bully boy tactics within this campaign? Oh, totally. Of course it was totally out of order. 
and Nigel behaved in a very discreet and calm manner. But sometimes I think you've got, you've got to fight fire with fire when you're dealing with the loony left. Shout, them, shout back at them. Give them a bit of their own firepower because they don't like it. Well, this is exactly what you did in your last radio interview, isn't it? I did what, yeah, exactly. Uh, let's talk now, then. let's move on. What do you make of the front page of the Mail today? They are now accusing MPs of claiming too much on expenses again. Yes, I did read that. I think the expenses they've claimed now are in total are 103 million. They're up from 98 million, so there's quite a big jump in the expenses. Well, what do you expect, I suppose? You know, there's no break on them. Uh, they've got a lot of free uh, time on their hands, you know, idling away, completing expenses forms. Uh, I think it's uh, an absolute disgrace. I think the salary they have uh, at the moment is well within um, bounds. It's far more than the average salary in the United Kingdom, which is £26,000. Uh, I certainly don't think they should be having any increase in their salary. I know it's proposed they should have a 10% increase. Uh, and also, this spreads out everywhere. It seems to me in the UK, the only growth uh, uh, business we have at the moment is politics. We've got 41 police commissioners on mm. salary of 65 to 100,000. Who we we've can't got... sack, if, even, if, exactly. even if the whole populace no longer wants them. Yeah, go Exactly. We've got, 60, uh, we've got 60 people in the Wales Assembly drawing down their salaries. And if you look at the local authorities, one thing I found absolutely inexplicable. For instance, the CEO of Lambeth Council, Derek Anderson, is on about £200,000 per annum. The CEO of Wandsworth, I think, is it Paul Martin? He's on 235000 Now, please and God, will someone tell me why any leader of a council is earning more than David Cameron, who runs the entire country? I know. The whole thing is completely arse about tit, isn't it? It's completely and utterly wrong and out of kilter. And also, especially when we've got this age of austerity. What do you think, though, about MPs? Because in that front page, also saying that many more than now are employing wives or husbands as researchers or secretaries. I'm not comfortable with that. What do you think? I'm not comfortable with it either. I mean, it's... I mean, I can understand their rationale because they, they will say they work, they work funny hours. It's the only way they can keep the family together. I've, you know, I've read all the excuses. However, there's a lot to be said for arm's length independence. And bearing in mind that these salaries are entirely paid for by us, the taxpayer, uh, why isn't it that, you know, one of the taxpayers who underpinning all this uh, should have the benefit of one of these well-paid yeah. and easy jobs? I mean, it seems to me, being an M- MP, the most difficult part of it is securing the post as MP. I mean, what on earth do they do all day long? They don't invest their own capital. Not, of course, you'd expect them to. Uh, they don't bring any particularly uh, high-level skills. What on earth do they do? do should we have them on time sheeting? You know, bankers... Uh, lawyers or all on time sheeting is that what they should be doing so they can justify what they're giving to us yeah because how the hell would you know what they're doing how many exactly. times they're and it's even worse of course in the house of lords when they're picking up these expenses without even turning up i take your point so but of course nigel farage your leader got into trouble he was employing his wife uh, on his mep's expenses that was wrong then as well then in your world view was it well on i say more view it's an ambiguous situation i think that these jobs should be open to all because they're being paid for by the taxpayer. Yeah. They're open. I mean, if it's a private company, private business, partnership, what have you, well, fair enough. So I think it's, it's a slightly ambiguous one. OK. Uh, let's move on then. Finally, what's come off the front pages, of course, is how we're going to deal with uh, ISIS or Islamic State or whatever it is or whatever they're called uh, this week. It seems like uh, Philip Hammond is saying we're not going to take... Uh, we are going to take... Uh, we aren't going to take action. Cameron says nothing's been ruled out. Do they actually know what they're doing? Well, to be fair to them, we have to be fair. There is a well-worn motto which says there are no heroes in the Middle East. Frankly, do we really know what's going on? Do we really know who's allied to who? Who's, who's funding which group? We, it's very complicated. It's a very, very, very messy situation. For instance, uh, early on in the campaign, we read the shock horror stories of the Iraqi army running away from Islamic State. Well, is that actually the case? In fact, rumour has it that the Sunni Islamic State uh, leaders actually bribed the Shia uh, generals or colonels in charge of the, that respect, those respective armies uh, and bribed them to go, run away. So, you know, it's all of a mess. It's all, who knows what on earth going on. I am slightly concerned about Obama's speech, though, when he is specifically saying he wants to give support to the Syrian opposition. For goodness sake, who are the Syrian opposition? Yeah. I think the Syrian opposition are largely the Islamic State. Mm. So he wants to bomb the Islamic State, <laughs> and at the same time, he wants to help them. So what on earth is going on? There's absolutely no clarity. <laughs> I frankly think, draw up the 
drawbridge, let them get on with it. So you would actually take a more isolationist view to it? Would you take a sort of, hey, look, we can't get involved, it's not our battle? I think so too. I mean, people will say oh, we may lose out in trade, we may lose out in the arms trade, but if I just go through quickly some stats, the number one arms dealer in the world is Russia, then it's the USA, then it's China, France. Remember, France didn't really get so militarily engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan as we did. Then it's us, then Germany, Italy and Sweden. And Sweden's number 11, Switzerland's number 15 are the world's biggest arms dealers. So Sweden, who never engages, Switzerland is always neutral. They're still raking it in from the arms trade. We have to go out there, get our youngsters' faces burnt off and their legs and arms blown off. And, you know, we, we are not top of the tree with the arms trade. I'm not justifying the arms trade. I'm just saying it may well be that we will not suffer a significant financial <laughs> economic loss if we withdraw altogether. And also, I think that the Arab League needs to step up yes. and take some action itself. It needs to organise... Oh. OK. Uh, we're talking at the moment to Elizabeth Jones. She's a senior UKIP activist with her views on the day's stories. If you want to join in, it's 020 33 97 1683. Or you can email us at, yeah, we'll read some of those soon, at gaunty at foobarradio.com. Let's just finish off then with the homegrown jihadists, those who have gone out there. Would you let them back in? How do we deal with them? Can we decontaminate them, their minds, when they come back? Or do you just hope that they die over there, Elizabeth? Well, I am, well, I think there's about 250 of them have already returned. And for the reasons why they're returning, well, A, they've got to sign on. B, their university terms began. They want to start, start back at the university. It's true. You're laughing. It's true. And three, the number one biggest reason is, of course, the U.S. Air Force is now bombing them. So uh, what would I do? Well, in an ideal world, I would say you forfeited your rights to be uh, part of Britain you stay, you go and find a home in your Islamic paradise. You've chosen that path, follow it. Walk down that path. Don't come back to uh, this country. Go and find a home in your Islamic paradise. But that's the ideal. Of course, in reality, we know they're all going to come back here. But then, of course, it's balanced. If you look at what happens with the, in the Bosnian crisis, we had a lot of people going over from this country to fight uh, in the Bosnian crisis, yeah. they came back to the UK. They didn't do anything. There was no disruption, no terrorism from the returners. I'm not saying that would be the case in this. But, you know, we've got to take a realistic view and look back historically as to uh, how returners have behaved. And with the Bosnian crisis, there was no issue. And before you go, what was this row you had on this radio station? Was it, was it with a Stop the War campaign? And what was your problem? No, no, Why no. Why did no, you it's... have to scream at her? Just tell oh, me. Oh, right. That was with the... Um, who are they now? Some, it's some variant of the Socialist Workers Party. Right. I was trying to explain some issue about, uh, from what I remember now, about inheritance tax, because UKIP's policy is to get rid of all inheritance tax. And every time I was speaking, trying to explain myself, I had this yipping, corrupt bankers! You're this, you're that, you're right wing, you're evil. All you know, all this sort of yip 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 in your ear, and you know, it's an insult to the listeners because the listeners are there. Anyone who's actually bothered to switch on to a radio station and bothered to sit down and listen to a program actually wants to hear what people are saying. It doesn't want to hear a load of, you know, SWP yip yap. Mm. So I, I just said, shut up, and she did. <laughs> Works. Top tip. I shall try that next time we get them on. It's good talking to you, Elizabeth. You're very, very entertaining. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Cheers, my friend. Bye. Elizabeth Jones, senior UKIP activist. She was good. She was good. She had a different twist on the stories.